Thanks, Dave. That was uh, quite a lot of material to cover in, in just the hour that we gave you. So um, thank you again. And uh, in that same vein, uh, for those of you that are either relatively new to OpenVSP and VSP Aero, um, haven't had a lot of time to play with it, or you're just getting started, and even for some of our more seasoned users that um, you know might need a refresher on some best practices for the tool itself, we're going to cover some of that and go into general guidance and uh, guidance for panel mode, VLM specifics, some things that you can do to try and troubleshoot. Uh, so with that, let's go ahead and get started. So again, we're just going to go through some of these bullet points, talk about a few things, um, but I want you to keep in mind that these are guidelines to, as a starting point. It's not necessarily comprehensive. Different models are going to have different behaviors. There are going to be certain things that will either work or break depending on how complex your aerodynamic model is. So the refinement is really up to you, but this should get you a good place to start. Uh, as a reminder for everyone on the line, I know I kind of breezed through my introduction, but again, I'm Brandon Litherland from NASA Langley uh, in the Aeronautic Systems Analysis Branch. And so the, the first thing and probably the last thing that I'm going to say as a part of this presentation is use a build-up approach. So you want to start simple and kind of like Rob mentioned at the very beginning of the workshop, it's think about what it is you're trying to find out. Think about a free body diagram, what really matters in the type of problem you're trying to solve. So if you only want the lift on, say, a wing, all you really need is the wing in isolation. It's doing almost all of the work for you. But if you want to try and get to something like a trim solution or try and account for the moments, then you probably need a tail. So you add additional geometry to the model as you build up in complexity. And here we've got, you know, the outline of the um, the common research model for the X57, and this one's the simple version that just has actuator disks. Under no circumstances should you be starting with this. You know, if you load this model up and just hit go on VSP Aero, it's going to crash. And it's, it's still a relatively complex thing to set up, and you might not know why it broke. We'll get into some of the why in this presentation. So the idea here is to build trust in your model and your methods. So if you have experimental data, great, compare to that and try and calibrate everything to it. Or you can compare to a similar model. So you should be able to see, you know, if something is coming out the way that you would expect. And then you can also look at the trends in your results. So you know that, say, VSP Aero is typically an inviscid uh, potential method. So as Dave mentioned, the lift curve is just going to keep climbing until you go up, you know, past a sine 2 alpha and it's going to start coming back down. So keep in mind the assumptions and the limitations of both the solver and the things that are in your model. And then you can gradually in increase your complexity. So if you happen to add something and it doesn't behave the way that you expected it to, why? Is there some feature in what you added that broke it? Or is there something going on in the wakes to where it's, it's being hit by something? Or is there some other aerodynamic part of the model that's impinging on this other thing? So if you start out with a wing and then you add things like tails or control surfaces or propulsion or bodies to it, there is an increasing complexity where you can either just have, say, a simple wing, you can have subsurfaces, you can have separate components, you can do actuator disks or rotating blades. There's lots of stuff that you can do. So again, if the SPRO isn't working, it's returning a not a number, it's giving you weird results, take away everything but the wing and then try again. Add one thing at a time until things break, and then why did it break? Try and figure out what it was about that that completely screwed up the model. And in some of these slides, you'll be able to find out some of the things that you should be looking for when you, uh, when you query your model. So as some general best practice, you can use clustering to your advantage to try and improve the solution, or at least give the solver a way to calculate uh, information where stuff is happening. So for example, you can give it more points out at a wingtip where you're going to have a larger drop off in the lift curve. And that's typically going to give you a more accurate solution than if you just left everything in a uniform spacing. And if you have a lot of points, it's probably going to give you a decent lift curve, but it's going to cost more time. In this way, you're giving it fewer nodes as compared to a completely uniform solution, but you're still capturing information out at the tip. 
So for a single section wing, you can use a root gradient or a re, uh, root strength of say one or two. And out at the tip, something like 0.2 to 0.25 is pretty typical where it, you can get some more information out at the wing tip. For a multi-section wing, however, you can set the clustering near section breaks so that neighboring cells are similar. You don't want to have, you know, the end of section one with a bunch of tiny high aspect ratio sliver cells and then have it jump like two feet. And those two side by side aren't really going to like each other very much. So you can set these reasonably close together, add a little bit more uh, cell density behind something like a propeller so that, again, where all the interesting stuff is happening on the wing, the solver has enough density in the panels to where it can capture those effects. And another thing to keep in mind here is that more points doesn't always mean a better solution. So in the examples here, we've got versions A, B, C, and D of the same wing, where we've got, say, the default setup where we've got 33 and 6, you know, 6 being in the spanwise direction, including the root and the tip. And then we kind of bump it up a little bit as we go. And you can see in the VSP Aero solution that, you know, solution A has most of it, but it's not quite right. And by the time we get here to where we have 41 points around the cord, 21 points in the span, we've pretty much captured it, right? And so going all the way up to 61, 61 didn't really gain us anything, but it cost us some time. And for something like this, where we're at 201 cord-wise points and, you know, really dense spacing, this is overkill for VSP Arrow. You, you don't need to do this. Something this accurate would be a really great place to start if you need to mesh up and go out to something that's a higher order RAND solver in CFD, for example. But VSP Arrow isn't going to like this. And in fact, the cells can become so small that they start to cause problems in the solution. Similarly, you'd like to avoid any high aspect ratio slivers. So in this case, we've got, say, six spanwise and a whole lot in the cords wide direction to where we've got these tiny little high aspect ratio cells. And conversely here, we've only got, say, 17 in the cord wise, but we I think this is like 61. And it makes these tiny little slivers out here. And that's going to cause you some problems. So try and avoid that. So let's focus in a bit on Vortex Lattice Mode. And sometimes what we see, particularly in the VSP um, Google group, is that people will throw a Vortex Lattice solution at something and they'll have nacelles, they'll have body components, they'll have all sorts of things included in the model. And really the bodies aren't contributing anything to the lift or drag because they don't have wakes. So they're not really going to contribute at all to the lift or drag but the body cruciforms do have an effect on the total moments. But these have to be used wisely because if there are any local interactions or local intersections with, say, the vortex lattice panels and the cruciform, you can cause problems for yourself where the local interactions um, start to interfect, uh, affect your solution. So you can try and avoid this by checking your degenerate surfaces and watch out for overlapping panels by using that camber degen surface representation mode. Some other things that you want to try and avoid are things like coincident surfaces. So if you have overlapping wings or body cruciforms that are right on top of each other. So you can see, uh, where did my mouse go? Here we go. You can see some overlap here between the vertical tail and that vertical cruciform that goes into the, the body of the fuselage. And probably one of, if not the most common issue that we see in vortex lattice mode is rounded rectangle because there are these straight sides on, uh, on the side of the section itself. Whenever the vortex lattice tries to collapse down into that potato chip surface, all of those points get collapsed into a single point. There's no distance between them and it throws an error. So if you try and run, you've got your fuselage on, you're using rounded rectangle, and the first thing it does is says not a number and crashes, that's probably why. What you can do is replace these sections with ellipses. So the vortex lattice fuselage is going to look exactly the same, regardless of the cross-section type that you have. It's using height and width and building it up. Ellipses will work better for this and for the contributions of your moments that you're trying to capture, if you're including bodies, the ellipse will work just fine. This also goes for things like body sections with vertical faces and closures. So if you're trying to have, say, a stack or some fuselage component where 
the DX is zero or the location of the cross sections are right on top of each other, it will do the same thing. They'll try and smash it down to a single point and you'll have a failure. But even a very small offset of these distances, uh, for example, if I'm working in feet, something like 0.02 is more than enough to make sure that these crashes don't happen and it will run just fine. And for VLM wings in particular, uh, when you have control of, say, leading edge and trailing edge clustering, use about 0.25 at the leading edge, 0.25 at the trailing edge, and that's a typically accepted uh, good clustering of points at the leading and trailing edge for the VLM mode. Moving on to discuss panel mode, you'll notice that you can't use blunt trailing edges on wings or bodies. But what you can do to try and help this along is to change native blunt edges to a sharp edge using something like closure or caps. So you can sharpen the aft facing body surfaces by either adjusting uh, coincident sections slightly. So that's more of what we were talking about with that, um, that nacelle. Just shift those sections a little bit and then you, you should be fine. And when we're talking about clustering values for panel mode, it's usually better to do, say, 0.25 or even 0.2 at the leading edge and leave the trailing edge value at 1. So you have some, some nice distance between the closing section and then the next one over it. It has a nice sharp edge to attach a wake to. And with the images here, we're looking at a few different ways that you can adjust the airfoil. So the flat cap that you see is going to cause a uh, failure when you try and run VSP Arrow. But if you put an edge cap on there, it extends it very slightly. It doesn't really affect the cord length, even though it does just a little bit, but it will run just fine. And you still maintain the upper and lower camber, uh, upper and lower surfaces of your airfoil. If you're using closure, you can use skew both, or you can maintain, say, the upper surface distribution by skewing the bottom but you want to set that to zero. And if you skew both, the camber lines maintained. If you skew, again, the bottom, it's going to bring the bottom surface up, but the top surface is going to be effectively unchanged. It's kind of up to you how you apply that. And something to keep in mind that airfoils are not all equal. You need to pick which one of these methods works best for you. Um, so you can do something like set uh, closure and set extrapolate and go to zero. But if you do that, it's going to take the tangencies on the top and bottom surface and loft it out to a point that's going to significantly extend your cord. And it's not really recommended that you do that. So another thing that you kind of want to watch out for is with subsurfaces in panel mode, you can inadvertently put the edges or the bounds of a, of a subsurface right on top of these interpolated sections. And you can see those right here and here. And in the solution on the right, you can see that this kind of made some hot spots where all of these were joined back together. There wasn't anything necessarily wrong with that, but you can see that these peak values where it's coming up with some of this are really, really large. So that tells you that something is wrong. If you adjust it a little bit, then you'll see that those peak values come down. So incidentally, that's one of the things that you can use viewer for to try and identify if there's something wrong with the model. Another thing to watch out for with panel mode is to avoid intersections for, that cause bad triangulation. So you can see that when we first tried to put this little glove and bat region together, there are some little slivers that are poking through where the intersection had a hard time putting the, the triangles and figuring out where the intersection was because these were exactly coincident surfaces. And when you try and run that, of course, you get not a number and it fails. But if we shorten the tip cord, decrease the thickness out here, give it some taper and have a well-defined region of intersection here, all of this comes together nicely. It's got a good intersection curve and this will run in panel mode just fine. And uh, there's a bit of an issue with actuator disks in panel mode. Uh, I've tried recently to try and add it through the GUI. You can add them in by modifying the input file yourself and then running VSP arrow from the command line. This is just a bug. And like Dave said, sometimes when we make new and interesting things, some bugs are introduced. So it's just something that'll be fixed here soon. Um, but you can see here that you can add actuator disk to panel mode. You get the blowing over the wing. The wakes are behaving relatively normal. And this is that same model I just showed that has the good intersection. Uh, 
So you can see that there's kind of a nice pressure distribution here from the fuselage down through the glove and back onto the wing. And you'll also notice that if you grid up something with comp geom or your running panel mode and it's failing and it shouldn't because all of the intersections are nice and clean, try and turn on the experimental file format. And because it's not necessarily trying to find any hybrid lifting surfaces, it's all panel tries, it's going to run the VSP geom and panel mode will end up working. Not quite sure why exactly that happens right now. It's um, more something that we're digging into, but just in case panel fails and you know that it should run, try VSP Geom by turning on this experimental file format button in version 325. Moving on to actuator discs, uh, and in the interest of time to try and make sure that we uh, get to our next by two o'clock, um, I'm just gonna hit some of these points and we're gonna continue on. So there are a couple of ways to use actuator disks in OpenVSP. One of them is the disk custom component that's packaged with OpenVSP, and the other way is to use a prop. So in the GUI, if you're using just a disk, uh, it doesn't really have the pointing vector to tell you which way it's oriented. So if you rotate in minus Y 90 degrees versus plus Y in 90 degrees, the disk doesn't tell you which way it's pointing. Propellers have the thrust vector built in, and then when you're ready to run something like, say, actuator disk mode, you can go to the design tab, switch from blades to disk, and then VSP Aero, at least in the GUI, is going to read all of those in and automatically have the hub diameter set according to your R0 value for the prop. If you really want to use disks and don't feel like uh, using the prop component, a really simple way is to attach a blank in, uh, to the component in both translation and rotation, and then the X direction is always going to be the direction that it's blowing. So that helps you keep your orientation. When you're trying to figure out your thrust and power coefficient for a disc, uh, these are defined basically according to these equations. So it's the thrust over the density, the revolutions per second squared, and the diameter to the fourth for thrust, and then the, um, the same thing for power, except you've got n cubed d to the fifth. And these are related uh, using the advance ratio here. So it's CT times V over ND will give you your power coefficient. So if you either know how much thrust you need and you know your advance ratio, you can get a, an estimate of power coefficient. Or if you know how much shaft power is going into a propeller and you know the advance ratio, you can back out how much thrust it should have. There are other ways and perhaps more rigorous or detailed ways of computing these, namely things like X rotor, which you can get from uh, the MIT source page. You can look up uh, Hamilton Standard Redbook Max, so things like HS Prop, which I don't know if Rob has that uh, open or not. There's your own blade element momentum methods, if you happen to have coded up your own. And you can even pull open the uh, propeller performance from manufacturers using things like performance tables. And when it comes to modeling things like rotating blades, just leave the prop in blade mode. Um, Dave went over this a little bit, but treat the blades like any other vortex lattice or panel surface. Use the same guidance for clustering and tessellation. This example on the right is the X57 cruise prop that's been released as part of the common research model. This is way, way, way too many points for trying to run this propeller. There's, I think there's like 100 or something or 80 in this, the uh, blade-wise direction here. So again, use few points in cord and, and the uh, blade radius, and chances are you're going to get a reasonable solution out of this. When you're trying to do this, you know, try not to let them hit anything. So if you have the root buried down in a nacelle, try not to include the nacelle at first. If you can avoid it, just make sure that things run and then again, build up, add complexity. And something that you'll notice is uh, don't set unrealistic RPMs for props. If you have a helicopter, and the rotor diameter is something like 40 feet, don't set the RPM to, you know, 4,000. Um, that's kind of a ridiculous value for something like that. The solution's gonna blow up. You'll see the wakes turn into tumbleweeds if it finishes at all. So um, for propellers, uh, we typically recommend starting with auto time stepping. And then if you need to kind of refine your time step or uh, the number of steps, you can do that after you get it working.
So uh, we're here at two o'clock. I've got just a little bit to go through here and then we'll roll into uh, VSPRO demonstrations. But I want to give you guys some tools that you can use to troubleshoot. And Viewer is really great for this. So the idea here is you open up Viewer and you take a look at something like the pressure distribution. And you're looking for things like large peaks. You can check the legend to see what those extreme values are, both in, uh, say, the upper and the lower value. If you see things that are completely unreasonable here, it tells you that there is some cell involved in the solution that's causing problems and, uh, and you need to take a look at it. You can also look at the wakes and see if you're seeing the roll up move as expected. If you're seeing, say, control surface deflections cause the wakes to dip down like they should. And even if, you know, if something is missing, if you intended to have a tail in the model and then you pop in and for whatever reason the set didn't include that component, and your moments look wrong, check the viewer. Make sure all of the components that you intended to run with are actually in the solution. Something that can occasionally get brought up is people will look at the viewer and say, well, why do my control surfaces look like they're in a completely different spot than what I prescribed? And that's mostly because this is for visualization only. The actual control surface deflection is being applied back here. And the deflection itself is just visualization. You can see the outline of the surface here in black, but a little bit of that panel ahead of it is being rotated with it. And that's okay. It doesn't mean that all of this was included. It just, it's there to show you where it's moving. And you can always check the results manager. So does the spanwise loading make sense? Is, are there peaks? Are there little drop-offs? Are there places where everything is, you know, failing? Um, and then, you know, just find areas that, that will help you identify whether or not the, the solution looks good. And you can always check the convergence. So if you click on that convergence tab, look at not just the L over D log residual, look at CL by itself, look at CDI by itself. And keep in mind that right now, 10 to the minus five is the minimum for log residual. And that's, you know, five orders of magnitude and you'll notice that if you get down to minus five and it just flatlines, that's that's as far as it's going to go. That's a good solution for VSP arrow. It's it's done. So sometimes you'll run, say, like 40 wake iterations, and by the third one, it's at minus five. You didn't need the other 37. You were good. So keep that stuff in mind when you're troubleshooting, and uh, and that'll help you identify some of the problems. Some other tips and kind of interesting things that you can do. Um, you can run panel mode on an imported mesh. So the same rules apply that uh, for the panel guidance. So that being said, like a CAD STL is going to be very unlikely uh, a good way to go for an arrow solution. The clustering is usually in the completely the wrong spot, but you can bring it in if you want to. And uh, there's another talk later in the week that kind of gets into how this can be useful. And you can also run CFD mesh grids in panel mode as long as the, the mesh that you give it is a quality grid. If you have, uh, say, a single section wing or even a multi-section wing and you're trying to apply dihedral at the root section, put a small constant uh, zero dihedral section down at the root, particularly because even in VLM mode, this gap is going to cause a problem. So if you put a little constant zero dihedral section here, it's going to make that nice and watertight and uh, your problems will typically go away. In the viewer itself, you can use the minus or plus keys to look at how everything's uh, the different agglomeration meshes that go into the solution. So if you see those and they are somehow anti-symmetric, something has gone wrong and you should check your grids again. And for running in, say, VSP arrow in the uh, command window, if you are trying to figure out the way to execute that well, if you run the GUI, the very first line in the, in the console output is the command line that you can just copy and paste, and it will do exactly the same thing from the command window. So a good way to set up something a bit more advanced to run in the command window is to run something from the GUI to automatically set up most of the input files, tweak all the input files to have the interesting stuff in it that you want, and then run it from the command line. And if you have some of these distributed propulsion um, arrangements where you have lots of propellers and you get tired of setting thrust and power coefficient and RPM all the time, uh, use links. 
just link all of the propellers together if they're all supposed to have the same values or you can use advanced links and that's a really fast way of setting everything at once so use that stuff to your advantage and of course for unique problems bug reports uh issues use the open vsp google group uh, because either Rob or Dave or myself or anybody else that's involved in the community, uh, lots of really experienced users, will jump in and we'll try and help. You know, we might not get back to you in an hour or two, but we'll usually have about 24 hour turnaround time and we'll do our best to help you along. Um, so that's what I've got for uh, VSPRO modeling. I know I've tried to kind of clip through and uh, we're about five minutes behind on some of the VSPRO demos. But really, the, the demonstrations here are going to be kind of an informal process where I'm showing you how you can make things work well, some things that are going to make it make VSPRO break. And, uh, you know, we'll we'll show you a bit of the things that you can do to, to help yourself along. Um, so appreciate that. And I'll go ahead and get uh, VSP pulled up. And Rob, if there are any questions that I need to answer in the meantime, uh, just let me know. Um. Not at the not at this moment. We had uh, maybe one pulled up that I answered uh, through text, but I think you're you're doing all right. All right, great. Uh, let's see.